Good morning, class. Good morning, Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. Uh, we welcome you today. Some of you have been joining us on a regular basis. Some of you, this is your first time. We've saved you a seat right here in the front. Get your Bible. Get something to make some notes with. Put everything off for these few minutes and just pause it. Give this your full attention. Not just giving me your full attention, giving His Word and His Spirit your full attention. And you'll be glad you did. You'll get help. You'll get answers when you give God your full attention. Father, we thank you so much for this privilege of knowing you, being able to hear you, being able to receive from you. We're convinced of your goodness and your graciousness and kindness. And so, Lord, we, we reach out for what you have for us today. And uh, the things we haven't seen, ask you to reveal them to us. The things we've let slip, we ask you to remind us and show us how to put it into practice. And we thank you for results when we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Look again, please, in our great textbook, the Bible. In Mark 7, we've been uh, in a series we're calling Faith for Healing. And we've been going one by one through the 20 individual accounts of healing recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We saw the healing of the leper, uh, of Peter's mother-in-law, of the paralyzed man, of the nobleman's son, of the man with the withered hand, of the centurion's servant, Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood, the two blind men, the Syrophoenician's daughter, and now we're down to number 11 in our study, the healing of the deaf man with the speech impediment. Let's begin reading again, Mark 7, 31. It says, Again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Zidon, he came into the sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. He took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plain. How quickly things can change. Perhaps it was years and years that this man was in this state of not being able to hear and not being able to speak properly. But in a moment of time, at these faith-filled words that Jesus spoke, be opened. It changed something. Hallelujah. When he spoke, something changed in that man's ears, in his head, in his mouth, with his tongue. Something changed, or several things changed. With just these uh, two words, be open. Hallelujah. Like we were studying on yesterday's class, you know, reckon we ought to say some things. <laughs> well, who would uh, uh, fault you for following Jesus' example? Years ago, a person tried to fault me and, and they said, well, who do you think you are? You know, you're just, you're just acting like Jesus. And I said, well, I, I thought that was the idea, <laughs> right? I mean, do you, do you have a better example for me to act like? <laughs> No, see, the same thing that we see that people do today, it happened with Jesus himself. Uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, things that the elders of the, the Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees, and doctors of the law found fault with Jesus 
Uh, and the thing ultimately that they condemned him to death for was that he claimed to be the son of God. And they said, you, you make yourself to be God because you make yourself equal with God saying that he's your father. In other words, who do you think you are? And even in his own hometown, that's exactly what they said. Well, well who, does he, who is he? We know his, his folks are here in town with us. And who is he saying all these things? Well, see, that's the enemy trying to suppress ministry and trying to suppress the will and plan of God through belittling, through disrespect. Uh, but the scripture says, and, and when, when they said that to Jesus, he said, well, didn't the scripture say you are God's? We have been made in the likeness and image of God. And instead of us, you know, it doesn't glorify God uh, for us to be failures, right? Uh, he, we are his children. A anybody got children? Anybody out there got children? Does it glorify you that your children are absolute knuckleheads and, and, and failures and they're just groveling in their nothingness? Does that make you look big? Well, no. Any good parent wants to see their children rise up and be able to do what they've been able to do, right? And in the natural, you want to see them go beyond. Well, the servant's not above the master. You can't go beyond Jesus. But he does want you to rise up and do what he did. Didn't he say, if you believe on me, the works that I did, you'll do also? Didn't he say it? Yes. Well, then it's not us being presumptuous and having, you know, grandiose ideas about ourselves for us to think that we could do things like what Jesus did and speak words like he spoke, pray like he prayed, uh, obey God like he obeyed. That is not uh, thinking too highly of ourselves. That is not uh, having, you know, false concepts. He's the one that called us to do it. He's the one who showed us how to do it and then called us to come up. Hallelujah. Come up and do what I've done. Follow me is what Jesus said over and over again. Follow me. How many want to follow him? Follow him. Somebody say, I will follow him. I will follow him. So we, we should be inspired by this and we should begin doing this. Like we said yesterday, calling those things that be not as though they were and speaking creatively for this to become this to be. And he goes on to say that his ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, and he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal, they published it. They didn't listen to it. And you might think, well, you know, maybe he, he wanted them to tell it. No, Jesus didn't play games. If he said something, he meant what he said and said what he meant. And so they should have listened to him. We'll talk more about that later. But they were beyond measure astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. I like that phrase, don't you? He, he has done all things well. Praise God. He has done all things well. He has, it reminds you of the Genesis account where it says God looked at everything he made and behold, it was very good. Uh, he, he doesn't, uh, you know, bring chaos and destruction. He brings healing and deliverance and restoration. Uh, cancer is not good. How can you look at cancer and say, behold, it is very good? Huh? How can you look at AIDS? How can you look at different diseases that that cripple the body, that destroy the body. You, you think about this. Uh, we are, the Bible said, God's handiwork. And we are uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. We are uh, masterpieces. And what I mean by that is um, we're also one of a kind. You know, one of the things that, that makes something really super uh, valuable. It's one of one. <laughs> well, you know, God the Creator, obviously, He could have done things any number of ways, 
there could have been a standard man and a standard woman, right? <laughs> and all of us exactly the same. That'd be kind of boring, wouldn't it? I mean, it's kind of like... <laughs> he could have, right? So, I mean, it would have been less involved, right? But he created us in such a way that there are no two exactly alike. Even what you call identical twins, they're not exactly alike. And they're not exactly alike in their spirits or in their minds. Uh, and that's the exception. That's, that's unusual. We are one of a kind masterpieces. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when disease takes God's masterpiece and destroys it from the inside out or from the outside in, and, and sickness and disease uh, emaciates the frame and distorts and twists until it barely looks like what God created. How can that please Him? How, how does that please Him? I mean, you go to some um, uh, master painter uh, who's painted this masterpiece, and then you take your little watercolors and you're going to fix it for him. <laughs> you're going to change it up. And you, you, huh? You think he's going to be pleased with you? You mess it all up? Huh? Or somebody's made this beautiful sculpture and, and you're going to go, you're going to make some alterations to it. You're going to change it up. No, all you're doing is destroying. You're destroying a masterpiece. Well, when something is destroying God's masterpiece, you can be sure it's not God and it's not His will and it's not pleasing Him. Do y'all hear this class? Now see, if you're confused about that, you can't have faith for healing. If there's any thought in your mind that maybe God sent this sickness into your body to teach you something or develop something in you, there's no way you can have faith for healing. No way. Because as long as you're questioning whether it's God's will for you to be healed, that renders your faith impossible to you. No, you've got to get it settled once and for all that God is the healer, not the source of disease. Right? God is good. Say it out loud. He does, he does all, things well. all things well. Now that, that same word well could be translated good. It can be translated excellently. It can be translated beautifully. Has God done all things that He has done? Are they beautiful? Yes. Are they good? Yes. Hallelujah. Are they excellent? Yes. yes, they are. And when God created, I mean, you can, we can see remnants of the original creation in our present day world. Now, what many have not understood, you, you hear people talking about that um, tidal waves and earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes are acts of God. No, God did not create the world this way. Romans 8 tells us the very earth and all creation itself is groaning and travailing. Well, why would it be groaning and travailing? Something's wrong. Can you see that? Something's really wrong with the planet. And people talk about saving the planet. Now, I'm not an advocate of seeing how quick we can pollute it and mess it up. But on the other hand, this planet is not going to be saved. It is so corrupted and defiled by sin and the curse and death that the scripture said, the Lord is creating new heavens and new earth. This one's going to be destroyed. With fervent heat, the very elements are just going to melt. So what we see is in a fallen condition. What we're in right now is in a very cursed, death-filled, curse-filled, fallen earth. And yet, you see remnants of its original beauty, don't you? I mean, it's, just, it's amazing. And what must it have been like before the fall? What must it have been like? There was no curse. There, things were not out of balance. Things were in perfect balance. There were no earthquakes. There were no 
hurricanes. There, uh, th there was no too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. The Lord did it right. It was perfect. That's how he could, when he finished everything, he could look at everything. He could look at the climate. He could look at the continents. He could look at uh, the, the cycles. He could look at the vegetation, the animals. He could look at everything and go, beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's very good. Well, everything that has come after sin and after the curse, all the diseases, all the deformities, all the, the, the imbalances, they're not an improvement on God's masterpiece. They are distortion. They are damage. They are what the enemy comes to do, to steal, rob from, to kill, and to destroy. And so you've got to get it settled that there is no way that God wants me sick and weak and limited. For one thing, how can I serve Him? Right? When I'm too sick to even get out of the bed. How can I go and do things for Him and fulfill my call and fulfill my ministry? And, uh, and you know, it robs you of money. It robs you of time. It robs your family of the brother, the sister, the husband, the wife, the, the father, the mother that they're supposed to have. Can you see this is stealing? This is stealing from you. It's stealing from them. This is destroying. Is it making you healthier and stronger? Then it ain't from God. Is it killing you? It's definitely not from God. Come on, can you see this? Now the reason I keep saying this is because there are millions of church-going people that believe God is the source of sickness and disease. They act like everything is from God. Everything that happens is God's will. Everything that didn't happen is God's will. To hear them talk, you would think there is no devil. They never even talk about him, never even mention him. Why? Well, the enemy's behind that. The enemy is inspiring you being oblivious to him so that he can just work unchecked. Nobody ever resists him. Nobody ever opposes him. But he is at work and you and I are not ignorant of his devices. Can you say amen? We're not ignorant. We know what's going on. Didn't the Bible say in Peter, uh, be on your guard. Watch, be, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, he's going about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Well, if disease is of him, you should resist disease. Amen. Right? Resist If poverty and lack is of him, you should resist poverty and lack. If oppression and depression and confusion is of the enemy, you should resist confusion, resist depression, resist heaviness. Somebody said out loud, I resist confusion. I resist, confusion. I resist heaviness. I resist, heaviness. I resist depression. I resist Leave me. Leave me. Go from, me. Go from me in Jesus, name. in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So many, even church going people, are actually just yielding and giving in to depression and all these things because they don't realize it's from the enemy. It's not to be. You're not supposed to just throw your hands up and go, Well, I, I can't help it. I just feel bad today. And, and I guess I just, you know, I've been having trouble with depression. And, Y'all pray for me. Well, it won't do any good to pray for you unless you decide at some point to quit giving in to it. Amen. You decide to resist it. Isn't that what the Bible told us? Resist it. Resist it. Resist the devil and he will flee. He'll go from you. But if you just lay back and give up and accept it, it's not leaving. It's staying and it's going to get worse. And worse. And that's how, that's how people become suicidal. It just gets so bad. And the torment is real. And it's awful, but you don't have to have it. You can be delivered. Is it true, class? You, you can be completely free. Somebody needs to say it out loud. I can be, I can be completely, free. completely free. Completely free. Completely free. And the scripture said, you know, whom the Son has set free, He is free 
indeed, and the Lord has delivered us from all the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. All you, the work's been done. Jesus has accomplished it, but you and I got to agree with it. And then we got to side with him in siding against the works of the enemy. He has done all things well. I like that, don't you? I like just say, say it out loud. He has done, he has done all, things all things well. well. Like we said, that word can be translated beautifully. He's done all things beautifully. Excellently. He's done all things excellently. He's done all things good. Good well. He, he makes both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. If you've had problems with your hearing, you can be healed on that one verse right there. If you've had problems with speaking, you can, you can be healed on this verse right here. Verse 37. Because it is written, he makes the deaf to hear. All you got to do is say, I take that. <laughs> I take that. Lord, you said it. You said it. So I take it. You make the deaf to hear. And if I'm the deaf, then you make me to hear. You make me to hear. If I've had trouble speaking, hadn't been able to speak, Lord, you make the dumb to speak. And even if you can't speak physically, you can speak inside you. You can say it loud on the inside. Hmm? You can say, you didn't hear that, but I said, you make the dumb to speak. Hallelujah. God will hear it. God will hear it. Next thing you know, you'll be able to say it physically. Out loud. Glory to God. Whew. Ears be opened. Tongue be loosed. Glory to God. It really is that simple to get a miracle. Now, if you scoff and mock, then you won't be bothered with it. It'll pass you right by. But you'll hear some of us shouting later and you'll go, ooh, wish I'd have got in on that. You can't. You can't. It's not too late to quit being slow and believe what God said. Believe his word. Believe his goodness. Have a little humility that there are things you don't understand, things beyond your grasp at the moment. You've only been alive that long. I mean, come on. Uh, all you got to do is look up in the night sky, you know. Think about the powers of, uh, of the elements. Uh, there are a lot of things out beyond, so many things. The, the premier scientists and experts of our day, they'll say, we don't yet understand, you know, we... We don't see, full. well, of course you don't. It's, it's, it's so big. But the one who made them is right about everything. And when he tells you, use your words, speak to it, then all you got to do is do it. Whether you understand it or not, just do what he said. I know my father in the faith, uh, Kenneth E. Hagin, who's in heaven now, he, he gives an example of benefiting without understanding. He said when he was a little boy uh, on the farm, they had cows and they milked the cows. And as a little boy, he could not figure out how a brown cow would give white milk and then you could churn it and make yellow butter. He's like, how'd that happen? And yet, all the while he's trying to figure it out, he's enjoying the milk <laughs> and the butter or making it into ice cream. Right? What's he saying? You don't have to understand it to enjoy it. Right? You don't have to understand it to enjoy it. You do have to believe it to benefit from it. But that doesn't mean you have to understand how it all works. Because, I mean, who can explain the new birth? Right? Well, if you can't explain the new birth, how are you going to explain this? You know, it's, it's all the same spirit and the same principles of faith and anointing and power. But he has done all things well. Say it another time. He has done all things well. Praise God. Backing up to the, the 31st verse again, 
like we said, is significant that the Lord, uh, through His Spirit, tells us uh, about the Decapolis, how these cities, because we're going to see referenced here, and then in actually in the next account of healing, we see another reference to one of the cities of the ten. And it has to do with the environment of these ten cities and this area. And what we're going to really begin to see in some detail is, does it make a difference the spiritual environment that you're in? As to if it's easy to receive or if it's harder to receive. And the answer I'll just give you ahead of time, and you probably already know, is, mm hmm yes, it really makes a difference. And that's one reason I say about faith school, I invite you to come in here with us. Uh, sometimes people say, well, aren't you coming into my living room? No, I want you to come in here <laughs> with us. Why? We got a real strong environment of faith right here. Hallelujah. All these guys brought their faith with them. And I brought my faith with me and everybody behind the camera and everybody on all the equipment. They brought their faith with them and uh, all the church around us and all the partners that pray for us. There is a real environment of faith. And in the environment of faith, it makes it easy. I'm telling you, it makes it easier and easier to receive the stronger that anointing is. We, we call it corporate faith and corporate anointing. Well, on the opposite end of that, when you find corporate unbelief, <laughs> then that makes it hard to receive. And we're going to see that that was the case in Decapolis. That was the case in this region and area. There was a hindering atmosphere of unbelief and disrespect for God and His things. And uh, that, like we said, is a block, is a hindrance. And that's why the Lord led him out of there and ministered to him. Well, uh, we, we just introduced this. You need to come back so we can get into a lot of detail with this. But our time's up again for today. Say it out loud like we do at the end of the class. I live by faith. I walk by faith. I overcome the world by faith. I'm strong in faith, giving glory to God. Somebody said, well, that's, that's a lot of faith, 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 faith. Yeah, you bet you. <laughs> Come back tomorrow and get some more. We'll see you soon right here in Faith School. I've got a victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.